I love a good rant. Yeah. I have, a, I tell my mom, I have a lot of soap boxes. <laughs> Obviously, so do I. <laughs> Every single topic, I'm like, I have something to say about that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Life Plus God podcast. My name is Alyssa Robinson. I'm your host. And today we are back with Reverend Gracie Millard. Yay. Yay. I need like an applause button or something (laughs) for every time you come back. Um, We should have our sound, each have our own like little sound. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And maybe every now and then throw in some crickets. I don't know. (laughs) But we are so glad. I am so glad to have you today because we are covering a really tough question. And that question is, what does salvation really mean? Uh, Because it's one of those really heavy churchy words that we don't dig into very often. Um, And then there's whole idea of atonement theories. What is it to be saved? Like all of this stuff. So we're going to dig into all of that. Before we get into that, I want to talk to the listeners for a second. Hey, if you've been really enjoying these podcast episodes and you think that uh, you have friends or family that would enjoy them and benefit from them, uh, don't forget to share them and also leave us a review. That helps other people start to see our podcast. So whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Wherever it is that you subscribe, uh, leave a little review for us and tell people why you like listening because, hey, we want to get more people in on this, you know, weird, big (laughs) faith questions podcast. So, uh, but let's do it. Let's talk about salvation. All right. So how... We'll solve it all in 50 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. How do we, and by we, I mean you, this is going to, this whole podcast is going to be a huge education thing for me because I just want to sit back and let you explain everything to me. So how do you define salvation? Yeah. So I personally define it as um, God's work in us and for us it's god loving us that's how i define it Mm. um i know that's probably not (laughs) i don't know if that's the answer you well what do you think i guess like what is the um assumed definition because i think a lot of times we we start out defining Mm. things because maybe the way we think of it is a little bit different from other people and i think salvation is one of those words that carries a lot of baggage yeah um yeah what do you think think is like the typical understanding of salvation yeah i feel like the typical understanding of salvation is that um we need saving from ourselves, from sin, um, from things that we've done and that God does that for us through Jesus's death on the cross. Okay. And I think that people, I think that maybe the, uh, the common understanding of what it means to be saved is, um, that you personally recognize that Jesus did that for your personal sin. Um, and so I think that's that's one very common understanding of salvation. So how is your understanding? Because what you initially said of how you define salvation, which is basically like God constantly at work and revealing God's love to us and through us, that feels very different mm-hmm. than that common understanding. So where did you get that from? Yeah, I think... Um, I think and we've mentioned this in a podcast before about how there's... I grew up United Methodist and there's not as much um, salvation emphasis from the pulpit in terms of how what we what I just defined as what a lot of people understand or think of when they think of salvation. We don't talk about like, uh, you know, Jesus died for your personal sins and you need to repent and ask for forgiveness. So there wasn't. um, So I think. I struggled with this a lot until I got to seminary and I um, started learning more about the sort of what is salvation and why do, why is it relevant to all Christians? Um, And 
because like you said, it carries so much baggage for a lot of people that it can be used. It has unfortunately, and not always, but unfortunately has been used to manipulate and guilt and shame. Um, and so it's definitely something that it's kind of like, no, I don't, I don't want to, that's not what I think about Jesus. I don't think that God is, um, a judging, um, hateful God that can only love me if I do this, that, or the other. Um, so somebody explained to me, or once I realized when studying scripture in some of my classes, that s- salvation has been, is, is in all, everywhere, all over scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It really is everywhere. And it's, you hear, ta- you hear uh, Israel talking about God saving and God being the one who saves. And um, so kind of coming to realize and learn that, oh, God has been, this has been a work from the beginning. Um, and it's so much bigger not to, I don't want to under, uh, I don't want to say that Jesus's death doesn't matter to salvation. I think We'll we'll get to that part yeah, later. I have questions but, about yeah, yeah, the yeah. Jesus event. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> of course, um, but that salvation has been is more than just that. And again, I don't want to make it sound like just the death of the incarnate God, but um, I think that salvation has been God from the beginning when Adam and Eve, when they you know are hiding from God in the garden, the first thing God does is start to provide for show them grace, save them by giving them clothes to wear. Um, See, and the common narrative to that is Adam and Eve are the reason that we need salvation (laughs) of like, they're the ones who messed it up. Right. Right. So you're, you're kind of debunking that being like, no, not exactly. (laughs) Yeah. It's just as a matter of, uh, when I began to understand, really think about who I believed God to be um, through studying scripture, but then also through personal experience, um, I really believe and I really wanted to believe God is a God of love. How can I reconcile um, an, a God who loves perfectly and who is love um, with this this idea that there's that death had to somehow be involved or, um, and so when I came to realize that salvation was, yeah, it's all about love. And I guess that can be used to say that, yeah, Jesus died because Jesus loves you. Um, I don't think that's completely untrue, but maybe I understand it in a different way. Mm. Um, so I think that's, it's through a lot of reflection and a lot of learning from about who I think God is. Yeah. So it, it feels very complex. Like it's Mm -hmm. not something that you can necessarily put a nice little bow on and say, this is the definition. This is what it is. And so I, I want to kind of explore the term of like being saved. Yeah. So that's a really big talking point in Mm -hmm. a lot of Christian faith traditions. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the United Methodist view of the idea of being saved versus Mm -hmm. salvation compared to maybe the more, uh, the, the broader view across Christian faith traditions? Yeah. So it's not very, uh, you wouldn't hear those words really in a United, from United Methodist preacher, most likely of being saved um, or, uh, from like from the pulpit, you wouldn't really hear that. Um, the United Methodist church doesn't have a doctrine of salvation. Really? They kind of recognize, um, that it's one of ironically, well, maybe not ironically, it's one of the least, uh, least agreed upon, <laughs> or there's so many views about salvation, trying to understand what it means to be saved, um, in Christianity and our denomination is what they call like non-doctrinal meaning you can believe other things and be, can still be United Methodist, whatever. Um, so the church does have 
sort of doctrines about who Jesus is, and you can't really separate who Jesus Christ is from um, salvation. So there's definitely is language about um, satisfying the um, satisfying sacrifice for our sin. Um, there is that in there, but again, you don't fully have to say that that's that's how you understand Jesus to be United Methodist. Um, so, so being saved, I have I take yeah issue with that too because of how I understand salvation. Um, I think that it's not a past like a one and done. Well, no, it's not like a, a momentary event. I, I in my understanding, um, I believe that it's something that's always happening. Um, and John Wesley kind of put language to that for me of that it's not um that it's a present thing. So it's always something that's happening. Um and it's the entire work of God. So it's been happening from before I existed and will continue after I, you know, die. Um but I think, uh, well, I mean, I, you and I have had conversations on past episodes that it was like a mention, but we didn't really get into it of like how, cause both of us were raised United Methodist. Uh, both of us grew up in the church. And so, like you said, there's not that moment in time mm-hmm. of like, oh, I was saved on this date, but for mm-hmm. a lot of people mm-hmm. there is, and yeah. that is how mm-hmm. they, they relate to salvation. But I remember, um, when I was in middle school and high school, any time that we would go on like big youth events or youth retreats yep. or whatever, it was usually hosted by a Baptist based organization sure. just because they're really good at that. Like sure. they're good at yeah. the big student life camps and things like yeah. that. But I remember there were always uh, times during worship where they would do altar calls or they would like the lights would be down <laughs> and the music would be going and they yeah. would have this like all of these light shows and uh, then like in a very serious tone they would be like who wants to be saved today mm. raise your hand and I was like I'm sorry I don't understand the question yes. like <laughs> yes and it, it was kind of like it didn't make sense to yeah. me I was like I don't really get it because is it being saved for f- from what <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah I think but it was meaningful to yeah. so many people so I don't want to discredit exactly. it and be like yeah. no that's not it because who am I like how arrogant would I have right. to be to well, be like no that's not the way it works right I think yeah in that case what that understanding of being saved is is that it's recognizing and accepting that um, for yourself, like your own personal transgressions, um, that Jesus loves you. And it's, it's from, t- it's taking, um, y- usually like a John three sixteen scripture, so- something along the lines of, um, so that whoever believes in him mm-hmm. will have eternal life. Um, so it's that belief. So it's based on the belief that only those who, um, believe in Jesus as their personal savior. Yeah. Um, so as the one who died for their personal sins, that only the ones who believe that can quote unquote go to heaven, have eternal life. Mm-hmm. So I wonder, I guess it's just not as catchy for like you to be <laughs> like, raise your hand if you want to participate in the ongoing salvation hey. that's already been <laughs> happening for you. Like, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not as catchy. To, like wrap your head around. Yeah. Is it, wait, what? <laughs> so, so is the thought is, is salvation only for Christians or is the thought of like, if this is work that God is always doing, that salvation is for everybody, no matter what you believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so most, I would say most Christians well, I think in general, Christians believe that Jesus is that the that salvation is for all, that salvation is intended for all of humanity. But then I feel like there's always this built in caveat of but you have to believe. Exactly. Yeah. So that it's open and available to all is 
tend to, tends to be the belief, but not all will choose or not all will believe. But why um, do I, I'm sorry, I'm going to no, keep doing that's this. Okay. Why do I have to choose salvation? Like if God chose me, if God has chosen each of us and to provide this ongoing salvation mm. for everybody, why do I have to choose it? Because it feels to me like God is bigger than that. Like mm. God doesn't have to wait on me mm-hmm. to choose salvation, especially like I think of people who are raised in cultures that just aren't Christian based cultures. Mm -hmm. And it's not like it would be going against everything that you were raised to understand. Mm -hmm. For me, it's easy. It was part of my upbringing. It's part of the American culture. Like you're not really fighting (laughs) anything to believe. Uh huh. But I don't know. Yeah. That's a big question mark for me. Yeah. Um, I think I think agree um it's kind of been one of the biggest uh i think arguments against christian belief that a lot of people who you know have been hurt by the church or just have never been part of the church and disagree with it i think that's one of the their arguments is that hey like if your god is so loving why would some people never get to experience that god or mm-hmm. why would why would Uh, that God choose to or uh, if the person was mistreated by Christians mm -hmm. why is that individual being held accountable for not choosing salvation Mm -hmm. when Christians so misrepresented who Christ is and who God is yeah like that's yeah it's really weighs on me (laughs) yeah yeah and I think it's yeah it weighs on me too it's um I think one thing that Christians have used to explain that is that they've tried to use to explain is that we have the freedom of choice. And um, so God has given a loving God chooses or allows us to choose rather than forcing us to choose um, or like just plain designate, you know, not giving us a choice in our eternity or whatever. Um, so that's, I think one answer It's a simplistic answer. It doesn't really solve completely solve the problem. Um, but it also puts responsibility on Christians to actually follow the way of Jesus, which is the way of love. Um, and unfortunately we fall short of that a lot. Um, and I, that, you know, it's really frustrating to be part of something that is, so m- more often represent misrepresented, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's do it. Okay. So, uh, we've kind of talked about salvation isn't tied to one moment in time and that salvation is happening throughout scripture, mm-hmm. not just in the gospels. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jesus was a pretty big event. Yeah. So like <laughs> what is, uh, the connection of Jesus and salvation? What is it that God was trying to communicate to us through that, that is different from the ways salvation has been presented? in other areas of scripture. Sure. Um, I think a lot of that depends on, um, there's a lot of different thoughts about that. Those are kind of the different atonement theories that you referenced previously of what is Jesus's role. Um, how do we tr- how do we put into words what Jesus, uh, what all Jesus did? Um, and so, um, you know, we look at what Jesus says and what Jesus does. And Jesus does say, um, you know, I have come to fulfill um, from there's that the passage in Isaiah that Jesus preaches to that to the synagogue in Luke four. Um, he said, I, you know, I've come to free the oppressed. I've come to release the slaves and um, and to set the world free. Um, Jesus also says that I've come as a ransom, um, Jesus. And that's where we get like yeah. the atonement ideas. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Exactly. So it's a lot about where, um, that's what people pick up on different understandings of what, um, what is unique about Jesus and what, what was God really trying to accomplish through Jesus? Um, and 
you can find that in what Jesus says and does. But again, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to interpret it. Well, what what are some of the atonement theories and how do they tie back to salvation? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are a lot, um, but I kind of, I picked sort of the ones that are kind of the main ones, probably the m- one that's most um, prevalent today um, is the... <laughs> is the penal substitution theory, um, which is really came out of the Protestant Reformation. So it's a um, uniquely Protestant belief that um, that God's about justice and get, that God's justice demands um, a sacrifice for sin because sin um, puts us at odds with God. Um, and so in the grand scope of Christian tradition, that's a relatively new idea. I didn't, is. I didn't realize that that was a Protestant thing. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that Jesus takes on that punishment. That's, yeah. that's a more relatively new way to, in terms of, yeah, modern history, it's only 500 years old as opposed to a thousand or 15 or whatever. Um, but there are ones that were like similar to that. There's the ransom theory is kind of similar to that of that um, God had to pay a ransom to the devil for our sins, that we were like a slave to the enslaved to evil and sin. And so that God had to pay um, that there's a lot about like justice and like um, sort of law sort of um like when you think about like court systems. So there's yeah. a lot, there's several that are about that sort of substitute that Jesus is a substitute for us. Um, but I would say that the, that, that one, that first one I said, the penal substitution is like all over, you know, Christian music and um, tends to be the one, the loudest one I feel like. Yeah. Um, well, like uh, amazing love. How can it be that, you a king would die for me and right. like that's the yeah. idea behind penal substitution is like jesus died for me and my sins because i was broken mm-hmm. yeah so all of that language comes out of this penal substitution theory yeah yeah it's all yeah all sort of based on that understanding of that's who jesus is mm-hmm. jesus is um the substitute for what i should have been mm. um And, you know, none of these, none of these theories are perfect, even the ones that I believe (laughs) are that because none of them are there, none of them can fully capture their problems with all of them. Um, Because that one sort of tends to paint God then more as a, why would God send God's own son to suffer this horrible death on purpose? Um, You can't, I'm not a parent. um, I can't. I don't know, but it's, you know, parents say like, I couldn't wrap my head around having to sacrifice my own child for Mm -hmm. other people because so I've heard it explained to me. So Nick McRae, the, um, who was the associate pastor here, whose Mm -hmm. role you stepped into, Mm -hmm. um, he talked about penal substitution a little bit once and how it gets a bad rap. According to him, I think that he uh, is on board with that theory, but he said the way he explains it is like, we think of it as like God sending God's son, but God and Jesus, if we believe in the Trinity are the same. Mm -hmm. And so really God is sacrificing God's self. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of pushed on that because I was like, well, then why did Jesus say, please don't do this? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, let this sure. cup pass from me. Right. Um, so it, it does. But I think that a lot of people with that theory have been like, mm, that sounds really abusive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, like I said, none of them are a lot of the, they all have reasons that they came about that they they make some sort of sense. Um, it's all people trying to make sense of what yeah. Jesus's role was um some of the ones that are um sort of emerge from being like I don't love the idea of God being this kind of judgy God I don't think that's who God is there's um this one called the moral moral example example um, theory that Jesus came to be an example um and was a perfect example of how to uh of a loving how to love, how to be, um, the kind of human that God designed for us to be. And it's like, 
um, being a self a sacrificial a self sacrificial love. Um, so that one doesn't um, say that God made Jesus die, but it was that Jesus was willing to, mm-hmm. um, and it puts more of it on the people, like, you know, the people who condemned him to death, whatever, and that it was Jesus's choice. Um, So there's the moral example, and that puts, sort of says, you know, that means his life mattered too. (laughs) Um, All the things that Jesus did during his life and in his resurrection um, and death matter. Um, But then, you know, that's not perfect because it's like, well, couldn't God just teach us? <laughs> yeah. Um, like, why did you, like, we had this beautiful example that didn't have to end in a crucifixion. Right. And you can be self-sacrificing love without actually, like, dying. Right, right. Um, so that one's, uh, that one's, you know, different from the satisfaction theory that it's about sin versus about love. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also... What's the other one? Oh, the Christ Victor, Christ the Victor, um, which is also kind of a newer one that's recognizes, yes, we are, um, we, in, we are, I have trouble with the word enslaved to evil, but we have, um, you know, sin has this somehow this stronghold over us, this power over us, um, and that Jesus through his life being a perfect um, perfect example of love, of never falling into temptation, um, never um, going against the will of God that in Jesus's life and then death, um, Jesus conquers the power of sin um, and evil. And so that one, I, I can stomach, a li- I personally can stomach a little better. Um, but again, it's not perfect because then it's like, well, but there's still evil yeah. <laughs> on earth. So what do we do with that? It's like, okay, well then they have well, to- Well, and then it makes it feel like God is powerless against the evil sure. that has uh, taken a hold on us. Almost like a spiritual warfare kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, vibe to it um so again none of them are perfect what about are there any uh that you know of that are more like uh original understandings of the atonement or salvation from like the orthodox tradition or um some of the original church yeah so probably the earliest one we have record or you know writings from is in the 300s ish with um his name is Origen, and he was um, Alexandrian, I believe, um, so in Egypt. Um, and his he was actually the ransom theory guy. Mm, he okay. kind of – he didn't um, call himself that, but, like, he was kind of the first one to say, hey, I think um, – trying to make sense of, well, Jesus um, – or Jesus was, was the ransom, like, using that scripture um, that Jesus calls himself – that he says that he is a ransom for many people. Um, And so he uses, goes off of that and says, well, we must, we, you know, the um, evil has a hold over us from Adam and Eve um, and original, original sin that um, was passed down to us. And so, well, he didn't really, I won't get into that. (laughs) Anyway, basically just the ransom theory was one of the first big ones. And then um, other ones kind of built off of, off of that. Oh, there's also um, in first Corinthians, Paul talks about Adam and Jesus being like the new Adam and Jesus being like the new Moses who, um, so he, this guy, Irenaeus, um, that's first century. So that's real, like, Fresh, really, fresh, fresh, yeah. fresh, exactly. <laughs> um, fresh takes <laughs> on <laughs> salvation. Um, that it was like, okay, Jesus, they called it the recapitulation is what they now That's call it. That's a fun it. word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that Jesus is the new head, um, re- reheads, quote, unquote, that um, Adam. So Jesus is the in- embodiment of life since Adam brought death. Um, Jesus brings us life. Um, Jesus undoes what Adam does. Um, Jesus is a better, uh, a better teacher than Moses. Jesus. So Jesus, um, 
is the, the best way I can say it is just like it recapitulates is what they call it, um, what everything humanity is supposed to be. Mm. Um, so that's that's probably kind of the first big one. So what all of this sounds like to me is uh, humans trying to put a uh, human construct mm-hmm. on who God is and mm-hmm. desperately trying to find language that we can understand. And mm-hmm. what we understand is warfare. What we understand is good versus evil. What mm-hmm. we understand is that there is a price to be paid Mm -hmm. all of these things just sound like us putting our like little human constructs and assigning them to god is it okay to just not believe in the (laughs) atonement theory in in any atonement theory or is that kind of like a requirement for like the jesus as savior uh story i think it's okay to have problems with all you know the these atonement theories that this was nowhere near the list of all of them. Um, I guess I, what I question is like the word theory is at the end of right. the word, right? Mm-hmm. And so theory means that we don't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some, you know, scriptural evidence mm-hmm. what, and then we can make assumptions based on that evidence that we have. But at the end of the day, it's still a theory. And mm-hmm. so is there... I don't know, like, is atonement specifically mentioned in scripture? Mm -mm. So, yeah, atonement is like also a fairly newer word. It's, I think, medieval-ish some point. Um, I know that's a broad time, but it's the at one mint is the is the source of the word that it's making. It's all about um, being at one with God. I didn't know. Yeah. Is that that doesn't feel real. It's it's real. But yeah. But that's English. It would have been English, right? No, and so it's not in scripture. The word atonement is not in scripture. This it all um I'm trying to remember if it was Cuz I was thinking of like, oh, it's got to come from like Latin roots or or something, I but think like it maybe it does, but it's um there's somebody who wrote about like one mint with God of like trying to describe like rec- the reconciliation of like making us at one with God. But yeah, it's like, a, I mean, all words are made up, I guess, <laughs> but it's a made up word in terms of like, it, they now you're getting it. <laughs> they, didn't have, they didn't have a word for it. And so they kind of just put it together. Um, I know it's, yeah, it's not, it's not itself in scripture. No. Okay. But salvation and saving and reconciliation and redemption and healing, all those puppies are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we just have to like build our own assumptions. I f- it would be so much easier if if this if scripture was like, this is exactly why this happened. Right. Or, well, I guess we have. Do we have anything in scripture saying why Jesus had to die? Paul definitely references things of. Um, about, you know, about Jesus's death, bringing life, um, and that we were slaves to sin, um, or the wages of, of, of sin is death. Um, and then Jesus brings life. Um, so yeah, there's no, I, 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 maybe it's because I'm, United Methodist and we don't have that sort of focused on why Jesus died. Um, So, well, I ask myself that every Easter. I'm like, yeah, we have this big resurrection celebration, but then we have this like time of mourning Mm -hmm. uh, leading up to it. And I'm just like every year, I'm like, why did this even have to happen? Mm -hmm. Like if, I mean, God could have avoided this. Like the, my understanding of like, I, I don't know. It just seems I kind of imagine like um, Dr. Strange hmm. <laughs> imagining yeah, like yeah, yeah. every possible scenario of what could have happened and narrow it down to, no, this is the one that has to happen. Right. This is the only one that could work, yeah. you know? Yeah. I don't know the mind of God. No. Right. But yeah. It just, I do. I question like, why, why is this the thing? Why was this the way? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know why. That well, I didn't is, expect you to have but, an answer to that but one. <laughs> I know, but um, one thing I think it is a valid thing to say of did Jesus have to die? I, I mean, 
I personally don't think Jesus had to die. I but it, and it's because of free the free choice. Yeah. I believe that we have that humans have free choice, and so I think I don't think that Jesus had to die, but I think that Jesus um, um, that the people around Jesus chose. There is that, this like bloodlust of yeah. humanity that demands violence and, and, could and Jesus, we're broken. Yeah. yeah. And could Jesus have stopped it? Yeah. Um, and there's that Philippians passage that is really helpful from my understanding where it says that Jesus was, it talks about Jesus's humility and the humility of Christ that Jesus emptied himself um, and was obedient to God and obedient to humility to the point of the cross. So I, to me, it's, um, that's why I don't think Jesus wanted to die. Mm -mm. Um, but I think Jesus was like this. I am not going to pull the God card here. Like this, I'm showing what love is. Um, and I'm not going to, um, I'm, I'm going to submit to the will of what hap what other people's choices are. Um, it's, and not, you know, it does. It still doesn't. It's still not a good answer, but it it helps me me understand it a little better to think that no, I don't think Jesus. I don't think God wanted Jesus to die. Yeah. Um, I don't think God made Jesus die. I think Jesus uh, accepted, accepted it. the fate. Yeah. See, and that's where. So, like, if I had to pick an atonement <laughs> theory, I think that the one that resonated with me most was Jesus as an example, the mm -hmm. moral uh, understanding, and that um, what we, when we look to Jesus as our example of how to live and how to love in a sacrificial way, mm -hmm. and then we decide to try to live in that way, mm -hmm. then I can get more on board with your understanding of salvation of like, I'm choosing to become a part of this salvation story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an ongoing thing that's constantly evolving, constantly changing. But that's also like, really hard to explain to people. Like mm -hmm. I said, it's not something that's easily wrapped in a bow. Right. Um, like Jesus died for your sins believe in him and you'll have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Like we simplified that, but, mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think that that's the one that I'm like, okay, I could get behind that yeah. one. Yeah. But, um, so I've been talking about salvation, atonement, all of these theories. What do you think that like these conversations and these you know, all of this work that we've done defining salvation, preaching atonement, all of these things, has it been positive or negative for the world and for the Christian, um, uh, I don't know, development? Yeah. Um, I think I know why you ask <laughs> because I think it's definitely done, um, had, ill effects and people using it to manipulate and people using um, misunderstanding. And I don't want to say that all, all the ways people have been hurt have been, has been on purpose. I think it's all about your understanding of what the good news is um, because I think people want to share the good news of, of, Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ brings. Um, so for some people, the good news they, as they understand it is that, um, they are not a slave to their sin, that they are forgiven and that they get to go to heaven. Um, and so that's what they want for other people. And so it comes across as you, it, it comes across as you need to realize that you're a sucky person. Sometimes yeah. this is how it comes across. Not all the time, but that feels like the bad news. Not right, the good exactly. news. Exactly. Like um, you got to bring people down to bring them up. Um, but then other ways to understand what the good news is, is that sal that, um, that love is here and that it's time for people to, that all, all the oppressed to f be free 
and all the people um, who have been pushed to the side to come to the middle. Um, and so if that's your understanding of what the good news is, then um, I think it does good to say, hey, listen to this amazing news that this this God loved us so much that God came down into a per like, to be a human being with us to show us what um, what this life is all about and to show us that um, God really loves the people who have felt forgotten and um, you're not actually forgotten by God. So if that's the good news, then that's really great. And I'm I don't you know people have probably used that to be manipulated to manipulative manipulative as well. Um, but I think when it comes to why have people come up with these mm-hmm. theories, I think it's all to try to explain um, why it's good news. Maybe. Well, um, and I I love that understanding. One of the things that I really struggle with is in so many ways, uh, the Christian church has become the oppressor. Mm. And so we're saying the good news is that the oppressed who have been pushed to Mm. the side now get to step forward Mm. and be at the front. Mm -hmm. But we're the oppressors in Mm -hmm. so many ways because Mm -hmm. we're judging people and we're, we're shooting people down and we're telling them like, you need to repent. You need to change your ways. You're Mm -hmm. living this terrible, awful life. And we're just making them feel like dirt. Mm -hmm. And then we're supposed to say, Oh, but there's good news. You know, Mm -hmm. you don't have to feel like the dirt you are, you know? (laughs) And, and it, like you said, it feels really manipulative. So I love the message of like, if we were to be true to the message and example of Jesus, Jesus, which is like, let go of all your preconceived notions and judgment and just love people for who they are, where they are. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good news. Right. Uh, but we mess it up so much. Yeah. And yeah. like, we think we're part of the salvation story, but then we're also a part of the oppression story. I know. I know. Um, I think, yeah, I, I tend to agree that when we're in the majority, like w- Christianity is not a minority religion. It became you know Constantine when Constantine made it the religion of the Roman Empire um I think that completely shifted the trajectory of the church and a lot of people would say yeah that's how the church grew so much but it may have also been what uh a lot of the message got convoluted Mm -hmm. um of the this is a religion for the the bottom this is a religion for the people um on the bottom and then um, Constantine made it a religion for the people on top. So, salvation, am I right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, don't, like, maybe, I don't exactly know how to close out this I episode. Know. I don't want to end um, on a downer. Yeah, I love the not... things that you said um, about your personal understanding of salvation. And one of the things that I do really love that you mentioned at the v- very beginning of this episode. Uh, that I hadn't really heard anyone say before, but I just knew uh, is that the United Methodist Church is a non-doctrinal church. Mm -hmm. And so that means we can have these conversations. We can Mm -hmm. have differing opinions. There isn't one right way to believe in God and one right way to believe in Jesus's role Mm -hmm. uh, in this universe. And so I do think it's really interesting that because of that, we get to have these conversations and question things Mm -hmm. and what does salvation really mean? Yeah. Uh, Is it something that we've just taken for granted and uh, have been going off the cue cards of what the church has given us? And so I, I think that for people listening who are, you know, more confused than they were when we started. <laughs> and um, say me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that this is a starting point for you to, to think about what do you believe around salvation? Take a look into some of those atonement theories and see what jives with you and what you don't like and, and call it out and roll around in it and wrestle mm-hmm. with it. Because that's one of the things I love most about the United Methodist Church mm-hmm. is our uh, willingness to mm-hmm. be uncomfortable yeah. and to not have the answers. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I, 
love that you said that, you know, if you have more questions about it after than when you started, I think we get so Same-sies. yeah, I think we <laughs> we get so uncomfortable uh, with questions and not knowing things. So we want to have like the simple answer. So I think that's one um, reason people don't want to think about, like I didn't want to think about, I never, you know, before I had to for a grade <laughs> learn and think about um, what salvation is um, it, because it leaves you with more questions. It's, and that, it gives you the brain fuzzies it's, for it's, sure. <laughs> it's unsettling. Um, but I don't, th- I think that like that shouldn't make you worried about, uh, about your faith or about who, um, if, you know, God is like, oh, she's doubting, he's doubting. It's like, I don't think God is worried about that. Um, God named God's own nation wrestles with God. So Israel. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gracie, for, I feel like the tagline of the life plus God Uh, podcast is asking big faith questions and providing no answers. (laughs) (laughs) And just confusing you a little more. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, I hope that y'all start asking big questions too. And as always, send me your big questions. If you have a topic that you want us to cover, uh, shoot me an email at Alyssa R at TMUMC.org. And I'll see if we can work it in because I love wrestling with these big faith questions. And Gracie, thank you so much for doing this with me and wrestling alongside me. You carry the brunt of the burden. All I have to do (laughs) is ask the questions and and poke Uh, at you. So thank you so much. Happy to be here. The Life Plus God podcast is hosted, written, and produced by me, Alyssa Robinson, and sponsored by Treach Memorial United Methodist Church in Flower Mound, Texas. If you live in the Flower Mound area, I invite you to stop by and see if Treach could be your church family. You can learn more about all of our programs and events at tmumc.org. Next week's episode will be brought to you by Men in Progress, a monthly podcast series hosted by the United Methodist Men of Treach to explore challenges faced by men. 